time to play with some white bricks. Never thought I'd say this, but I'm going to build another little furnace. Uh, it's not actually like a foundry furnace. It's going to do like literally everything else. In this video, we're going to walk through the design, uh, the materials, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, insulating fire brick and ceramic wool because I've seen a lot of people use it. There's a lot of details that I've never heard anyone say, so I went reading. I'm going to share those with you, give you the reasons why I'm doing it the way I am, and uh, hopefully with the information, you will be able to uh, better design your own furnaces or little heat treat ovens or what have you. I literally made like, like drawings and stuff for this. So I'm going to put on my nerd glasses and we're going to go over it. So in this poorly framed shot, you might recognize some stuff. You won't recognize other things. Uh, you definitely won't recognize me planning anything out, but we'll get to that later. Quick rundown. Insulating fire brick, lightweight, 28, means 2800 degree rating. Got a couple of these kiln elements. Got my plans. I got a knife for some reason. I don't even remember. And I got cough drops so I can continue talking without dying. Why does this have more paper on it? Eh, you know, maybe if I can't talk, I should get out of this cold, dry, dusty garage. I now realize the thing that I want to use, I didn't draw up. So let's get out another piece of paper. Here's what I want. I want fine control. You're never going to be able to read my handwriting. I'm sorry, but it makes me feel more official. I want fine control of temperature and atmosphere. So temperature, that's obvious. Atmosphere, not so obvious. What I mean is uh, air has like oxygen in it, among other things, and I want to be able to control how much oxygen is in there. So O2 in my foundry furnace, which is gas fired, videos on that a uh, long time ago. That is done by how much air you let through the burner. This is going to be done similarly using a gas injection thing, which we'll talk about later. But the temperature is going to be electric. So I'm going to draw little, little lightning bolt things zapping. To achieve this, uh, I'm going to use a, 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 a controller. A, a controller that I'm, that I'm going to like, someone else is going to build. And it's going to have a box full of like magic pixies and a thermocouple and that's going to tell the computer how hot it is and I'll be able to control it and make it do whatever I want. The one I'm using is made by a company called Orton. Not affiliated, not a sponsor, but they make lots of junk for furnaces. So using that, control the temperature via electric element, atmosphere controlled via a terrible method of spraying propane in that we'll go over later. I want it to be pretty small, so it's easy to control and it doesn't use too much energy. I was thinking round about the same size as my foundry furnace. The foundry furnace, FF, 240 volt, less than 30 amp, because that's all the service I have here. And I do not want to cut or shape fire bricks. Insulating fire brick is IFB. By that I mean... I don't want to do what I did with the foundry furnace and like cooper all these parts and make it all elaborate, which means it's got to be square or like rectangle or something. You got it? Okay, now let's look at the design. Actually, no, give me that back. Clearly I haven't thought this out. When you hear fire brick, there are multiple kinds. Heavy fire brick, insulating fire brick. I also have ceramic wool down the middle. We'll go through these each one at a time. Just remember, you might hear Heavy fire brick, insulating fire brick, light fire brick, whatever, talked as two separate things. They're not. They're like categories, and there are many kinds of each one. So do not take this as like a set thing. These are just generalizations. So heavy fire brick, insulating fire brick, R factor, the insulation. You hear things measured in R factor, like windows and insulation. Yeah, it's how much it prevents heat transfer. Higher R number, more insulating. Heavy fire brick does not insulate for crap. Insulating fire brick obviously does. Insulates a lot. Ceramic wool, I'm told, insulates way better yet. But clearly, it's not a brick. Density, heavy fire brick, much denser. That's why heavy, obvious. Insulating fire brick, very light. That's because it's very porous. There's a lot of air in there. So clearly, air weighs less than brick. Air insulates better than brick, hence all of those terms. Light brick, insulating fire brick, whatever. 
Strength, however, heavy fire brick, very heavy or very strong. Insulating fire brick, not at all, not as much. Wool, the ceramic wool, you heard it called kale wool, ins wool. They don't have any strength. You can't build nothing out of them. This specifically, by strength, means uh, compressive strength, weight pushing down. Heavy fire brick, concrete in general, all those things, not a lot of tensile strength, but compressive strength. That's, you know, you're building a building. Thermal mass. Here's an interesting one. High means it takes a lot of energy to heat up a fire brick, a heavy fire brick. It takes a lot more energy to heat this up 10 degrees than it does to heat up an insulating fire brick 10 degrees. It also means when you remove the source of heat, the heavy fire brick will give off more heat while cooling down 10 degrees than the insulating fire brick will. So this will heat up faster, this will stay hot for longer when the heat source is removed. I'm pretty sure ceramic wool is even lower quite a bit. Cost, obviously. Heavy brick is cheaper. Just a brick is a brick. Insulating brick takes a lot more work to make and it's it's just it's way more expensive. I really don't know how to quantify kale wool on that because they're they're totally different animals. You know, they're they're one's like a, a spongy fibrous thing and then these are bricks, clearly. Now this short list of characteristics kind of gives you a sense of why you might choose one over the other. In general, Cheap heavy fire bricks are some, a lot of times they're rated for 3,000 degrees. A standard insulating fire brick is like 2,300. I paid extra to get 2,800. But you can get 3,000 degree insulating fire brick. You can get higher even. They tend to be very expensive. Now there are times when you want, clearly, you might want more strength. And there are also times you might want higher thermal mass, like slow heating, a, a, a full giant like furnace kiln thing made out of heavy brick, will take a lot longer to heat up. Yes, it'll take more energy, but slow heating is sometimes good. It'll also be slow cooling. And if you have a, a heating system that's, say, on or off, like a furnace, furnaces, they, they don't tend to throttle. You know, you don't get a little bit of heat or more heat or more heat. They cycle on and off. So it's full on, full off. And a, a heavy brick, something with high thermal mass, will uh, swing much less. So it'll swing not as hot, not as cold. It'll stay closer to the middle. It's a little more little more even than, say, if you were to build out of a low thermal mass material like insulating fire brick. This design is going to use insulating fire brick and a bit of ceramic wool for extra insulation because of this right there. There are many different grades and uh, insulating fire brick, the place that I got it, I'll put the name on the screen now, that's the place I used to get the bricks for the foundry furnace there, you know, it's it's like two-day shipping from where I live. It's really handy and they have a website you can just order stuff. Uh, they have listed, I think, 23, 24, 20... 6, 28, 30, 32 degree insulating fire brick. And as the temperature goes up, the price goes up with it. I chose 2800 degree fire brick because one, it's really hot. I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be able to melt 2800. Also, as the price goes, as the temperature goes up, the price kind of goes up exponentially. And this was kind of a good balance of, of temperature versus cost. Also, the different grades have different characteristics. So different ones are different amounts of insulating, different amounts of, of compressive strength, and so on. And I think the 2800 degree ones, of all of the varieties they had, were the strongest in compression. I might be wrong there, but I think that's how it worked. I believe they have all that information on their website. They may not. I don't know. Don't quote me on that. But just know, insulating fire brick, the white ones, and heavy fire brick, they're not, they're not uniform, okay? It's not that simple. Anything with materials is going to vary significantly. These are just generalities. Also, they screw with you a bit on the sizing. This was slightly disturbing when I found it out. Basically, the standard, the book I read said the, the standard, the world standard and the American standard are different. This is the normal world standard, according to that book. 9 by 4.5 by 3. Basically, length is 9, width 4.5, thickness is 3. And they're that way because the width goes twice into the length, the thickness goes three times into the length. This means no matter how you lay your bricks, they all kind of work out. It makes it really easy and convenient because if you're building something large, it's not going to be one layer. It's going to be multiple layers, and it helps to have multiple layers and different like layers going different ways, right, to, to kind of to kind of tie them all together. The American standard, nine by four and a half by two and a half. That means the thickness doesn't really line up. 
And you can't even add one more. Like, you think, oh, well, what if it's just four into that? It's not. Four into that's, like, up here. So they, they never quite line up. And it's, it's, it's angering because, I don't know, I'm just uncomfortable with that, even though it totally doesn't matter in this case. Three inches, obviously, thicker than two and a half, more insulating, probably more expensive. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. Does that bug you? Am I the only one who's bugged by that kind of thing? Anyway, if you go to the website that I use to order these bricks... Uh, the ones that they have on the website that you can just, like, you know, add to cart and deliver to me, and it's nice and easy, uh, they're all two and a half. Although, if you're reading on the website, they have three, they can they can get you three inch, but I imagine you have to, like, call them and give them, like, what you want. Probably cost more. I don't know. I will say this. I did have to deal with their customer service because they sent me the wrong bricks at first. Their customer service is excellent. They're very quick. They're very friendly. Everything was great. Uh, I, I have zero problems. I'm not affiliated with them. Again, I'll put their name on the thing. Not affiliated with them, not sponsored, nothing. But they are excellent, check them out. Now onto the design. This, where I've darkened and overlined in Sharpie, is, uh, is the walls from the top looking down. Pencil lines are just how I'm gonna lay it on the bottom. You might notice the bottom sticks out. I'll, I also have a 3D model of this, which is probably gonna be easier to understand, so I'll put that on the screen now. Pretty easy to understand the layout of the top. You'll notice the bottom. Uh, sticks out a little too far and the top is going to be exactly the same. You can see that in the model You can also see that here in the pencil line. The pencil line is the top and bottom It's just eight pieces sticking around and that little extra zone on the side That's where I'm going to put a bunch of ceramic wool. I'm probably also going to wrap it around the back But I, I need the front end to be open and I need it to be open because I need to put the wiring through and uh, a couple other features, but first first let's talk about the elements these are the elements that I got, but to really understand how this is going to work, let's show, let's go to the actual kiln over there and take a look. Here is a kiln. It is a Scut 181. It is very old. You can see it's made out of uh, insulating fire bricks. They're kind of cut at an angle, round as steel enclosure. The top, you can kind of see the bricks peeking through the coating, and it is four bricks high. Each brick has one element going around it. Uh, it goes around, you know, comes in, goes around, all the way around, drops down, goes all the way around again, pokes out. That's one layer, one element, one layer, one element, one layer, one element, one layer, one element. Each two layers go into these switches. I, I suspect low is uh, 110 volt, medium is 240, but only one of the two elements. High is both the elements at 240 volts. Simple. Easy. This is really, this is a really old, this is like a 50 year old kiln. The elements are in these grooves. It's like a, the cross section of this looks like a T. You know, it goes in and it drops down, but it also goes up. So I imagine it was some kind of like router machine. It uses four elements. This is a 20 amp thing. The elements I got are the same length, but I only have two of them. They're slightly higher power because they're from a newer version of this kiln. And the kiln is much smaller. So each element, I'm actually going to wrap around three times. I'll, I'll show you what I mean. This poor drawing, this top one, shows you kind of how it works. There's this groove. It's kind of a T shape. You know, I, I bet they used like a, something like a router bit that spins to dig it out so they can stick the element in and drop it down in this little groove. And I got two of them. These are actually staggered because, I mean, if you remember five seconds ago, you saw they were staggered on the inside because they like wrap around them. It's got to go like up. It's details, details. We're going to details later. That's the original. Here's how I'm going to do it. Three courses. Now, to, to, to kind of get away with this, I'm going to have to move the top and bottom ones up and down a little bit to make room for one in the middle. I also can't make quite a large wide T shape. So I'm just kind of going to make one groove just wide enough for the element so I can fit another one in the middle. Again, here, staggered, because they're going to have to go around and wrap up. Round, wrap up. They're probably going to be staggered more than this, but... I mean, the hole that I'm going to put through is quite small, so I could I could probably get away with that. We'll find out. All of this is subject to change, except the Sharpie parts. And then even that, even that's subject to change. You can see here, I have a little hole on the bottom. Propane inlet needs outlet. I might put an outlet, like, up here, like, up here, maybe, like, a hole in the top. And then I can, like, if I need to plug it up, I'll have something I can just set over it. Like another little chunk of fire brick. I got a bunch of little chunks of this stuff all over. 
That's how I'm going to, to adjust the, the atmosphere. So in a normal electric like furnace like this, uh, or an electric kiln, the one you just saw, it's called an oxidation kiln because all the oxygen is still in there. A gas kiln, or my gas foundry furnace, it, I tend to run it a little bit rich, which would mean reduction. There's more fuel. There's a lot of fuel. uses up all the oxygen, and there's a little bit of extra fuel left. Now, in, in the, if I'm melting, like, if I'm melting, say, copper or whatever, having no oxygen is good because then it can't oxidize the copper. Now, if you're doing something like pottery, the reduction atmosphere will actually pull oxygen atoms out of the glaze and the, uh, and the clay, and it'll, it'll change. It'll look different. I don't know if that affects heat treating at all. Uh, let me know. Do, does heat treating work more or less good with uh, uh, an oxidizing... Uh, or reducing slash rich lean atmosphere. I don't know. You tell me. That's what this is going to be for anyway. So it's, it's kind of important that I look into that. Going to need a thermocouple hole. I'm thinking here if I can slide it in between the elements, it's, that's, that's going to be tough. I can also just like stick it through the top or stick it through the side or whatever. I, I don't really know how big that hole needs to be. This is, a, this is half scale, by the way. Probably should have mentioned that. I, I, I don't know what to do with my hands. Now the reason we have these kind of large holes, here's the element, it's not just the element. It also comes with uh, insulators. You know, so the hole going through is pretty tiny. It's actually, that little hole is all I need to poke this, this through. But this is insulation for that. It also comes with uh, crimp, crimp connectors and these little pins. You couldn't see these pins in the, on the kiln, but they're in there. They basically just, you, you poke them into the fire brick and they hold the elements in place. So if you're wondering how I'm going to hold those elements in those shallow, narrow grooves that are only as big as this, those pins. That's how I'm going to do it. It's, that's, that's how you're supposed to do it. Now let's talk about the lid. It's going to be eight bricks, kind of heavy. Uh, the side bricks, if you take a look at this, if you take a look at this, the pencil lines are the top and the bottom. These side bricks are going to be resting on top of this. No problem. These middle bricks, however, are dangling dangerously over the middle. Two ways I'm going to combat that. First off, take a look at this. The center line of the brick is actually over the edge of the outer brick. So when it's just sitting there, it's not going to want to tip. It's going to be like, like right on the edge of wanting to tip. But it can't because there's another brick right here. Secondly, I'm going to put a steel enclosure around it and around the whole thing, because you don't want exposed ceramic wool. Despite what you may have seen on YouTube, that, that crap is bad to breathe in. So cover it up. And here is proof of concept of the steel enclosure actually working. Now these fire bricks, this is my foundry furnace lid, these bricks are hanging over the edge. They might want to tip down as well, but this steel has been holding it in. It's basically like putting a, a it's not like squeezing in around the edges, but it's not going to let any of them back up and want to tip out. So I know it's got a coating, but you can kind of see where it's cracking and you can see the bricks. This is held up very well, despite like some of it looking bad. You know, this is flaking. I might need to shore this up just a wee bit. Whoa, is that, that's really scary. Anyway, that's what happens when you, I mean, I've melted cast iron with this thing. So steel is not going to like it too much, but it works is my point. Concept proven. So, got the structure figured out, got the insulation, got the enclosure figured out. We're going to wire it up with these kiln elements that I got. What's left? Control. Control is where this comes in. The Orton controller. Basically, thermocouple and connects to the elements. Now, it's pre-programmed to do a bunch of stuff, including like heat treating, uh, mold burnout, precious metal, glass stuff, pottery cones. But it's also programmable. Find some clean stuff. I need a better marker. Okay, so let's say this is a chart. I've done crappy graphs before. Here we have temp and time. When you, when you turn on a furnace, temperature increases to a point wherever it shuts off for whatever reason. I mean, the, the rate of climb tends to kind of start slowing down at some point. Let's say right there you want to turn the thing off. Then it's going to decrease in temperature, and that decrease is going to, uh, the slope is going to start leveling out. So basically it's going to be a steeper decrease as the difference between the inside and the outside of the, the furnace is, is higher. So if it's hotter inside the furnace or it's a colder day or whatever, it's going to decrease quicker. And as those temperatures equalize, it's going to flatten out. 
just like when you first turn the thing on, it's probably going to heat up a lot more until uh, you start equalizing like temperature in versus temperature loss. So basically up here, the reason this is steeper down and this is less steep up is because of temperature transfer between the inside and the outside. You know, bigger difference, more temperature transfer from the inside to the outside, and uh, shallower this goes, steeper this goes. Now, the angle of this is called a ramp rate, like how fast it heats up, how many degrees per whatever amount of time. Here you got max temperature, here you got another ramp, like how, how quickly do you want it to cool. Now this is more or less how I run that pottery kiln over there, same for my foundry furnace. I heat it up absolutely as fast as possible to the temperature that I want, and then I'm, then I'm done, I shut it down. What this controller will allow me to do is say I want to heat up for a while, and then level out for a while, and then heat up really quick, and then heat up slow, and then hold, and then drop a little, and then, then hold, then drop really slowly, then put it into free fall, then hold again, you know, this is, this is pretty complicated. This is called a firing schedule, right? How, how much time and what temperature and what ramp rates and all that you want. And this controller, again, made by Orton, not a sponsor, but I would be happy to accept some cones, hint, hint, if you're watching. This, this sort of thing is impossible for me to do with any sort of accuracy with my foundry furnace. But with this controller, I forget exactly which Orton it is, but it's made by Orton. There, there's a bunch of other, uh, other kiln controllers and furnace controllers and stuff. This can be programmed by me to do whatever I want. So let's say there's a certain metal out there that has to be heated up to this amount, and I want to hold it for a certain amount, and I want to cool it down really slowly. I can program it to do that, and it will do it very accurately, because the whole system is not designed by me. It's got a thermocouple, and a computer brain and programming by some nerds with either even thicker glasses. Now using that little that little propane spray hole trick, I'll be able to heat it up to whatever and let's say right here, I want it above there to be in a reduction atmosphere, a, a, a rich atmosphere, fuel rich, oxygen poor. I can just turn on the fire right there out of that uh, little thing. I'm gonna spray some propane in there and say I wanna keep that burning all the way until it gets back down here and then it really doesn't matter after that. I'll be able to do that. So I'll be able to control temperature ramps, time spent holding at certain temperatures, and atmospheric conditions. So, give me some information on heat treating. That would be fantastic, because I can do it now. Well, not now, but like, give me a couple weeks to build this thing and then we'll be able to do it. Sharpie drop, end of graph. So uh, yeah, I think I've explained Poorly, most of the features of this electric kiln heat treating furnace oven thing. If you have any other questions, leave them below. The uh, next one of these, uh, we will start building. And I mean we. We were probably going to have a special guest and uh, look forward to that. I'm looking forward to that. Hey.